When you're in a tough spot, you may wonder where the Lord is. Pastor John Randall reassures us he is right there with us at our hour of need. When did the Lord come to Paul? In the middle of the night, in a dark moment, in a difficult season, Jesus showed up. Aren't you glad when the Lord shows up in those moments? We need him to show up now. I think of what the psalmist said in Psalm 46 in verse 1 when he said, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we don't fear, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Hello again and welcome to A Daily Walk, where you never have to walk alone. And that message rings loud and clear in the passage before us today. We'll meet you in Acts chapter 23. At various times in our lives, we'll find ourselves afraid and feel like we're all alone. But God has a message for us at such times. Take courage, be of good cheer, and God will stand with us. Paul needed to hear that at this season of life. So let's be encouraged by the Lord who stands with us even during difficult days like these. Here's Pastor John Randall. Over the last nine months, we've been studying through this book of Acts. We find ourselves this morning in the 23rd chapter. I'd like to draw your attention to the 11th verse with a message entitled, God's Providence. Acts chapter 23 in verse 11. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness of me in Rome. One of the themes that runs through the book of Acts is how the gospel made it from Jerusalem to Rome. And here in the 23rd chapter, there isn't any major doctrinal truth being brought to the forefront, but there is a historical narrative that records the providence of God. Our reading reveals how that God is working behind the scenes, that there are natural events that take place And yet the Lord is working supernaturally to accomplish his will and his purpose. Have you ever had the experience in your Christian life where you can look back and you can see clearly the hand of God at work? Do you recall a time when you were simply going along in what seemed very natural was actually the Lord supernaturally directing your life. The scriptures are full of similar stories where we see the Lord working providentially in the lives of his people. In the Old Testament, for example, we see the Lord working in the life of Joseph. It seemed that everything was against him, and yet God was working all things together for good, in Joseph's life. We think of Esther, where the name of God is never mentioned in the book itself, but you can see him at work in every chapter. One thinks of Job, and Job would say that the Lord knows the way that I take. When I go to the left, I can't find him. When I go to the right, I can't discern it, but he knows me and he knows the direction that I'm taking. Job was confident that God was working providentially. It's through divine providence that God accomplishes his will. To ensure that his purposes are fulfilled, God governs the affairs of men and works through the natural order of things. And that is what is seen in this chapter. What we are doing this morning is tracing the providence of God in natural events. And when we last left the Apostle Paul, he was on his way to Jerusalem. You see, the church in Jerusalem was experiencing persecution and they were struggling 
financially. And so Paul encouraged all the Gentile churches that he had planted to collect an offering. And it was his sincere hope that the offering from the Gentile churches would serve as an olive branch of peace between Jews and Gentiles, and it would create a stronger bond of unity. Now, when Paul arrived in Jerusalem, the church welcomed him and they received the generous offering. They gladly listened to Paul's testimony about the good work that had been accomplished in the planting of churches in the Gentile regions. Nevertheless, Jerusalem was much different than when Paul had been there before. Not everyone was as enthusiastic about Gentiles coming to faith as Paul was. Furthermore, there had been many false rumors circulating about Paul's ministry. His accusers were saying that Paul teaches things that are contrary to the law of Moses. They said that Paul was perverting the truth of God's word. And these were very strong accusations. And unfortunately, the majority of the people believed what they heard. The leaders in the church in Jerusalem came up with a solution that they felt would mend the fences and silence the critics. They asked Paul to go to the temple and to perform a series of rituals and ceremonies that would be an outward demonstration that he was in no way opposed to the law of Moses and that he hadn't lost his Jewishness or respect for the traditions as some had assumed. Paul was being asked to do something that some would have seen as contrary to everything that he taught. However, Paul, being a Jew, had great compassion for his Jewish countrymen, his brethren. He said he was willing to become all things to all men that he might save some or win some to Christ. And so he agreed to go through with their request. And everything seemed to be going well until someone spotted Paul in the temple area. And they assumed because they had seen him earlier in the week traveling with Gentiles that he actually brought those same men into the temple and defiled one of the restricted holy areas. This false assumption gave way to the mob that mobilized and the next thing that Paul knew, he was dragged outside and being beaten to death. The Roman soldiers heard that a riot had erupted and so they dispatched their soldiers and Paul was rescued from the clutches of the crowd. As the Roman soldiers pulled Paul away from the riotous mob, Paul made a request. He actually asked if he could share with all the people his testimony. And surprisingly, Paul's request was granted. And under the protection of the guards, he began to speak in the native tongue of the Hebrew language. And the people listened intently. As Paul began to share his testimony, he shared about his conversion, how he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He then went into the details of his calling to serve the Lord, which included the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. When Paul said the word Gentiles, the crowd once again broke out in a frenzy and rioted a second time, tearing their clothes, throwing dirt into the air and saying that Paul should be taken away. The Roman commander was uncertain why the people had rioted. He didn't speak Hebrew. And so he ordered to have Paul beaten in order to extract a confession from him. But before they could interrogate Paul, he took advantage of the rights that he had, which protected him as a Roman citizen, being innocent until proven guilty. Still without a crime to convict the apostle, the commander decided to have Paul stand before the Jewish governing body to discover his crime. And that brings us to the 23rd chapter where Paul is going to stand trial before a 70-member governing Jewish body known as the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was made up of both Sadducees and Pharisees. It is believed that prior to his conversion, Paul being a Pharisee was actually a member of of this governing body so many years earlier. And the first thing that we learn in this courtroom is that Paul declared his innocence. Look with me now, chapter 23, verse 1. 
Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I didn't know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Paul had been accused of many things by many different people. Yet none of the false accusations were true. And therefore, when he gave his opening remarks in the courtroom, he said his conscience was clear. It meant that he felt there was no reason for this trial to begin with. He claimed to be an innocent man. And when the high priest heard the words of Paul, he ordered him to be slapped. Striking an uncondemned man was illegal in court protocol. And so Paul, being aware of this, was quick to point out to it by referring to the high priest as a whitewashed wall. By the way, that was an insult. (laughs) It was a term that meant you were a hypocrite. It was unlawful to strike someone for no reason. The only problem was Paul didn't recognize that it was the high priest that spoke to him. And once he found out, he apologized. Even though the high priest was crooked and corrupt, Paul recognized his position and apologized. Can you imagine Paul standing there before this judiciary group? Remember, he probably knew many of them. They were probably former friends and colleagues from his Pharisee days. Paul knew that he was already considered guilty and there was no way that he was going to get a fair hearing. And so he improvised. And what he did is he changed his approach in his defense and he decided to appeal to the Pharisees' theological beliefs over the Sadducees. Look at what it says in verse 10 as we see Paul now divides his accusers. Oh, he declared his innocence. Now he divides his accusers. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee. I'm a son of a Pharisee. And concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead, that's why I'm being judged. And when he said this, a dissension arose between Pharisees and Sadducees and the assembly was divided because the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, no angels or spirits, but the Pharisees confess both. And then there arose a loud outcry and the scribes and the Pharisees party arose and protested. They said, we don't find evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, hey, let's not fight against God. Now, when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul be pulled to pieces, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they came from different religious backgrounds and beliefs. The Sadducees, well, they were the political religious group that held a great deal of power among the Jews in Israel. They were the aristocratic class that was connected with everything going on in the temple of Jerusalem. They tended to be the wealthy. They had the powerful positions, including the chief priests and the high priests who were actually Sadducees at this time. And they held the majority of the 70 seats of the ruling council of the Sanhedrin. But the Pharisees were more the common men. People tended to lean toward what they had to say because they were unlike the Sadducees. The Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Bible. And the Pharisees held to the entire Old Testament. The Sadducees rejected the belief in the resurrection, but the Pharisees believed in a resurrection and even a future judgment, either for reward or punishment, depending on how a person lived their life. And so Paul, very shrewdly, knowing that there were theological divisions and differences between these two groups, he sides with the Pharisees in order to escape. And in that moment, those who were once united against putting Paul to death or imprisoning him were now divided among themselves. And Paul was once again delivered as another riot breaks out And Paul was taken back 
to the barracks for safekeeping in witness protection. But try to imagine what Paul felt like at this moment. I personally believe that at this time, everything began to sink in. All that he had experienced in only a few short days began to take its toll physically, mentally, spiritually, he was exhausted. There were those around him who would have looked at Paul's trip to Jerusalem and think, we told you, what a waste of time. Why did you go there? We've been telling you this whole time. Now look at what happened to you. What good had Paul accomplished in going to Jerusalem? The offering that he brought to the church? Well, they received it, but there's no record of them thanking him for it. How about the opportunity that he was given? to share with an angry mob his testimony. This was a lifelong ambition. I mean, he wanted to share with people of what Jesus had done. And he was so convinced that they would see him as their Messiah. If he could only have the opportunity and he was given the opportunity and it seemed that it backfired. It led to a riot rather than a revival. And then he gets his opportunity to stand before the Sanhedrin, a group that he used to be a part of. And he ends up getting slapped, insulting the high priest, causing another riot. And I can't help but wonder if Paul began to replay all of the warnings that he received. Could this have been avoided if he had only listened? Did he really hear from God? Was he in the center of God's will? I believe at this moment that Paul would have felt very alone. And besides that, here's a question. Where were all the apostles? They didn't have his back. I mean, when Peter only a few years earlier, was put in prison, there were prayer meetings around the clock that he would be delivered. No no record of a prayer meeting for Paul. And what about the churches that Paul had planted now that he was a prisoner and would remain a prisoner from this moment on? Paul would be a prisoner of Rome. What would happen to all the churches? What would take place when he was gone? I want to ask you this morning if you've ever felt like this felt as though God had led you to do something that you had envisioned and yet it didn't turn out the way you had hoped. In fact, it ended up becoming a mess. And as time went on, maybe it went from bad to worse and he began to feel as though maybe you'd failed God and he began to feel alone and it seemed like nobody understood. And when it was all said and done, you really couldn't see any hope and you simply began to despair. This is where the Apostle Paul was at, at this moment. And you can read some of his deepest thoughts. He writes them down for us in his epistles while he was a prisoner. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, here's what I believe Paul was feeling at this moment. Listen to what he said. We were burdened beyond measure and above strength. We despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves in order that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Again, Paul writes in that same epistle in chapter four this time, he said, we're hard pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. And we're always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ that the life of Jesus might be manifest in our body. That's what Paul was feeling at this moment. He was perplexed. He was in despair. He was knocked down, but he said, I wasn't knocked out. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't sure where to turn. This was a dark moment in Paul's life. But in the midst of it, something wonderful took place. There was a divine visitation from Jesus. The very next verse where we began in verse 11, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness of me at Rome. First, make note of the fact that the Lord came to Paul When did the Lord come to Paul? In the middle of the night, in a dark moment, 
In a difficult season, Jesus showed up. Aren't you glad when the Lord shows up in those moments? We need him to show up now. I think of what the psalmist said in Psalm 46 in verse 1 when he said, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we don't fear, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. And Isaiah, the Lord declared in chapter 41, verse 10, and I'd encourage you to receive this today, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I'll strengthen you. Yes, I'll help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Isaiah 43, it says, fear not, I've redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You're mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. The Lord came to Paul in that moment. And maybe you're in a dark season today. Listen, the Lord is here. He's near to the brokenhearted. He is light in the midst of darkness. Not only did the Lord come to Paul, but the second thing we see in verse 11 is the Lord stood with Paul. Jesus not only showed up in the situation, but he stood with him in close proximity to him. No social distancing here, friend. He was right up in it, right next to Paul. He was there with him. He was near to the brokenhearted. Paul would write to Timothy right before his martyrdom. And this is what he would say. He would say in 2 Timothy chapter 4, at my first defense, no one stood with me. All forsook me. May I not be charged against him. And then he said this, but the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me. Listen, if you've got Jesus in your corner, sometimes that's all you need. There may be other people who vacate the premises. They're not available. But the Lord is there and he'll stand with you today as you stand with him. In Psalm 27 verse 10, It says, when my father and my mother forsake me, that the Lord will take care of me. Maybe there's even division in your family. And the Lord said, I'm there. Maybe things aren't going well in that department, in that area of your life. But the Lord said, I'm here. I'm right here. One man by the name of Harry Ironside said this. He said, quote, God is never nearer to his people than when they cannot see his face. He is never closer than when they do not hear his voice. Somebody has well said that God is often behind the scenes, but he moves all of the scenes that he is behind. And it is well for us to remember that, that there are times in all of our lives when it may seem that we've been forgotten by God or we find it difficult to pray So we walk through what appears to be darkness and yet God says, I'm with you. It's good to know the Lord is with us no matter what we go through. Well, that's a wrap for today's A Daily Walk with John Randall. As we leave you, we'd like to say how much it means to each of us every time we hear how God is at work in our listeners' lives. It would be so encouraging to hear from you So please write today while it's fresh in your mind. Our email address is adailywalk at gmail.com. You can call us toll free at 877-242-0828. That's also the number to call if you'd like a copy of today's message. We can send that to you for a cost of just $5. Again, reach us at 877-242-0828. You can also visit our website to listen to today's message at adailywalk.org. And while you're there, you'll notice many other available resources in the e-store. Well, Pastor John's wife, Michelle, has a new book for women of all ages. It's Perfected, A Journey Through Proverbs 31. Now, this is the first in a series of five mini Bible study books, ideal for small group summer study, one-on-one, or even for mother and daughters. We're offering it right now for the reduced price of $10. Call 877-242-0828 or go to adailywalk.org for easy online ordering. 
You know, here at A Daily Walk, we look to the Lord to provide for us and sustain us. We know these are difficult and challenging financial times for many of you. But if God has blessed you with a little extra this month, we'd very much appreciate your support. This would be a wonderful time to hear from you during these summer months. We've tried to make it easy to make a donation online at adailywalk.org or call 877-242-0828. There are some ways we can stay connected. Check out Pastor John on X, formerly Twitter, and Instagram for biblical encouragement throughout the week. Follow him on X, previously known as Twitter, at PJRandall7, and on Instagram at John P. Randall. Again, we're talking about God's providence on the next A Daily Walk. See you then. This program is brought to you by Calvary South OC and made possible through the support of our listeners.